Hello, um, welcome to our ACME research meeting. Today, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Rafael Jaramillo, who is uh, the Thomas Lord Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering at MIT. Uh, his research encompasses uh, material science, solid state physics, and optoelectronic technologies. His current interests lie in uh, defect and phase engineering of calcogenite semiconductors with an emphasis on developing processing methods to control sulfide and selenide thin films. Uh, Dr. Jaramillo earned his PhD from the University of Chicago for his work on antiferromagnetism and quantum phase transitions in chromium. Uh, he did his work under the supervision of Professor Thomas Rosenbaum. Um, later on, um, Dr. Jaramillo uh, worked as a postdoc at Harvard and MIT uh, on topics in oxide uh, electronic materials and calcogenide thin film solar cells. Uh, Dr. Jaramillo is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Award from the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Laboratory, uh, the Department of Energy Sunshot Postdoctoral Fellowship, and the National Science Foundation Faculty Early Career Development Award, the Career Award. Um, he lives in Cambridge with his wife and kids. Without further ado, Rafael, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Igor. I'll repeat myself and say that I'm really, really happy to have this opportunity to present. So thank you uh, to the organizers. And um, I'm, I'm happy to be home with my family and not have to travel, but, but I'm sad not to get to visit. So. Um, so here we are, uh, but I do get to share this with you, and, I, and, um, and I'm excited to because this, this was a new talk that I got to put together for you. So this is about uh, calcogenite perovskites. Right, so I'm going to step through um, a series of, of, of chapters here. So let's start with the fundamental motivation. Why should you care? Um, this is a pretty fundamental motivation. I, I, I want to take complex oxides, which we, we spoke about a minute ago when we were... Um, uh, leading up to this presentation, you know, we, we, many of us have worked in, and I want to replace the oxygen with sulfur and or selenium. And um, why do I want to do this? I want to do this because I like to work on semiconductors. So I want to lower the band gap while retaining some of that physically rich combination of ionic and covalent bonding that, that makes complex oxide so interesting. And, um, and I want to realize new semiconducting materials with useful physical properties. So that's pretty broad. Here's a little bit more detail. Uh, there are a number of theoretically predicted calcogenite perovskites. What I've done here is I've taken theoretical predictions and I've put them uh, simply on a number line, ordered by band gap. No special meaning to this other than that they're ordered by band gap. And these are all uh, the literature had to offer to recently on sulfides and selenides in the perovskite, rootless and popper and lithium nitrate structure types. And uh, you know, um, you, you could you could take all of these with any of these with a grain of salt because these are DFT predictions. Fortunately, uh, those materials that have been made and measured, they have band gaps which are very close to the predictions. So what I've done is I've marked in, in little black dots here, the values of, of measured strontium hafnium sulfide, barium hafnium sulfide, and, and so forth. And so you can see uh, that DFT is a, is a decent guide, um, which is how I tend to use it. it. It's an okay guide, and it can give you an idea where to start on experiments. So the point here is, is that these band gaps are in the visible and IR, even into the mid IR, although probably it's fair to say vis near IR. Uh, here, I've used the colors true to I until you drop into the infrared and then I just made it deeper red. But the, the takeaway here is that, you know, we're not, we're not dealing with oxides anymore. These are all semiconductors and that's exciting for me. So making this a little bit more, okay. So another important point is that the materials that have been made and measured so far are very stable in air, very, very stable. Um, for instance, barium zirconium sulfide, you can heat to 550 degrees C in air before you see any sign of degradation. And, and they're made of earth abundant and non-toxic elements. Barium has some toxicity, but you know, that, that's for another talk. So that's a good thing. But I wanna motivate epitaxial growth, which is gonna be the topic of the last half of this presentation. So I'm gonna do that with this, this plot instead. So this is a very well-known plot in, in optoelectronic engineering, and you see it plots the band gap versus the lattice constant. And on here are all the semiconductors that you know and love with four new ones, which I know and love, which are, um, I've put on here four calcogenite perovskites. This isn't an exhaustive list, but these are materials here 
one, two, three that have been made and measured. And one which, which has not been made and measured, not yet, which is that selenide there. And that looks good, that looks interesting. But the thing is, um, that's not useful with that epi growth because those measurements have pretty much all been on bulk powders, which people have made through the years by solid state synthesis. So, you know, this plot is only good if you can make heterostructures through epitaxial means and then move on to making devices. So anyway, this motivates the work on epi growth. Okay, so that's the motivation. Now I'm gonna step through a number of projects which we've done to measure the properties of these materials. And these are in varying degrees of depth. None of these are very satisfying in terms of depth because I kind of have to move fast. But I wanna convince you that, that there's um, more than just this sort of high 30,000 foot motivation for looking at these materials are actually really good. So the first view on the properties is about dielectric polarizability, which is something which is intellectually very interesting to me, and I think also bears on performance. So it's true that materials in perovskite and related crystal structures are highly polarizable. So the, these structure property trends are established in oxides and halides. And we just make a very simple-minded uh, prediction that these trends will extend to semiconductors, that is materials with a Visnior or band gap. And we're interested in this because uh, I like strong electron quantum coupling, maybe from my days I'm working on correlated oxide physics. I'm interested in measuring polarons and I'm intrigued by hypotheses that exist in the literature that some of these dielectric properties are useful for photovoltaic performance. That is, they can slow down non-radiative defect assisted recombination. Now the jury is out on that, but we're gonna need a good model system to study that. And, and that's part of the motivation. So this hypothesis is just that. What I'm saying is that if you take a map of the band gap versus here, the low frequency polarizability, and you look at it, you're gonna see the SP3 bonded semiconductors down here. And the Y axis, by the way, is a log scale. So you're gonna see you know, phosphides, zinc sulfide, silicon, all these materials here with the polarizability around 10. And you're gonna see complex oxides and ferroelectric materials up here. And of course, you know, the, the particular value here you can take with a grain of salt, it, it's large. It doesn't matter whether it's 2000 or, or, or 10,000, it's large. And, and then you have some really kind of peculiar materials. You have phase change materials of GST, you have tin sulfide, you have fappy and mappy, the halide, lead halide perovskites, which are much studied these days. And we're hypothesizing that that if you make calcogenide perovskites and measure their dielectric properties, that you'll land in this space, which is kind of an empty space. And so we published that in 2019. And then in 2020, we published our experimental results, which were very satisfying to us because we did find that um, these zirconium-based calcogenide perovskites, and here I'm speaking a little loosely. When I say perovskite, I kind of mean perovskite and all the related crystal structures, just to save a mouthful. So this is the rootless and popper structure, and this is the perovskite structure. And we made and measured um, a lot of little samples, and we found that, yes, they, they are among the most polarizable semiconductors known. In fact, in this Visnior IR band gap range, they are the most polarizable semiconductors known. And so we, we enhanced this plot a little bit. Now you see the lead salts here, which are very well known. Um, but these, these, these dielectric responses are stronger than for FAPI and MAPI even. So we found that very interesting. This, these measurements were, were a little bit of a challenge, and I think it's fun to illustrate a little bit how we, how we did that. These are microscopic single crystals grown by a flux method. And it's a little hard to measure the dielectric response of such things. So we, we did it like this. We made little capacitors by hand. We wired them with silver epoxy. My student wanted to measure the dimensions because you make little capacitors, you have to know the dimension if you want to discover what the dielectric polarizability is. And so he went and he went to the um, X-ray tomography tool, which I'd never used before, which is used for studies of bone fragments and other things. And he was able to make these beautiful measurements. He also was able to do a lot of non-destructive inspection. So this is an example of a sample which, which had a hidden void. So he'd you know, taken the time to wire it up but then in putting it in the x-ray machine, we can find that it actually is a void. And so, you know, we can't trust the measurements of the sample. And measure, it, the tomography measurements like this really helped us um, remove the outliers from the experiments. So that was really quite nice. Um, these 
although they're polarizable, these are still itty bitty little things. So they have a very small capacitance. So we had, you know, we had to make some custom circuitry to shield them and, and put it into the cryostat. And, um, and the other thing is that I was kind of excited to look for low temperature phase transitions, but we didn't find any. So, so we measured down to something like two and a half Kelvin, like pumped helium, and, and we didn't find any low temperature phase transition. So, um, so that's a little bit on the boring side for the physicists, but it's on the good side for, for stability of these semiconductors. So, um, so the next property I want to highlight is optical absorption. So these, these 113 perovskites have a direct band gap and they're very strongly absorbing. Um, the reason that they're very strongly absorbing is that you have this hybridization here at the band edges and you have a large density of states. You know, you're, you're, you're exciting to zirconium 4D manifolds. So there's a lot of states available. And so they absorb light very strongly. And so these are some data. This is our ellipsometry and spectrophotometry data, the orange stuff, showing you the absorption coefficient of, of bearing zirconium sulfide um, thin films. And we also compare to bearing zirconium sulfide bulk published from the um, group of Tokyo, including uh, Hideo Hosono. And then, you know, we put on the same plot measurements for other, you know, more well-known semiconductors, like three fives and two sixes and MAPI. So, um, you know, these are kind of uh, early measurements in the sense that there's first of a kind measurements. It's nice that our measurements agree with the group in Tokyo studying the same materials. They're obviously very strongly absorbing materials. We don't have that sharp band edge relative to some of the very high performing semiconductors out there. And, and we don't understand why that is. So those studies are ongoing. Okay, what about excited state transport? For those of you who work on solar cells or lasers um, or ambipolar transistors, I guess you care about minority care and ambipolar transport. So, so if we're gonna focus on solar cells, we know that accurately measuring the excited state decay rates is really important. This is a plot which I made showing that a long minority carrier lifetime is a necessary but not sufficient condition for solar cell performance. So, so this is a scan of a bunch of different materials and the reference is here. And you know, the point is that you can make a crummy solar cell out of a long lifetime material, but you can't make a good solar cell out of a short lifetime material. Right? You need that long minority carrier lifetime. Now, when I made this plot, we had just engineered these tin sulfide solar cells. <laughs> so we made the best darn solar cells from 50 picosecond lifetime materials that I think anyone will ever bother to make. But, but now we're focused on different materials. So now we're looking at the calicogenite perovskites. We had some preliminary data suggesting that they have very slow defect assisted recombination, which was published in 2018, we published that in 2018. And so we thought we should look at this in more detail. So, um, Somebody wants remote control on my screen. Is that okay? Should I give remote control on my screen? Um, remote control? I would, I would say no. Somebody okay. probably just hit the wrong button. Okay, all right, got it, cool. So I wanted to, uh, oh, they asked again. Richish Chaya is asking for remote control on my screen. Okay, so I wanted to look at this in more detail. And, and so this is what we did. Um, this is a little bit inside baseball. So for those who, who don't do a lot of TRPL, um, I apologize. Oh, this keeps on coming up. I better hit approve because, well, okay, it keeps on popping up on my screen that Charya. Well, Chaya. you shouldn't probably. That someone hit yeah. the wrong button. Okay, Who was it? T H A Y Y A. Okay. Okay, I, I, I declined. Yeah. All right. So, um, so TRPL, time resolved photoluminescence, produces data sets that look like this. And that's pretty much the type of data that you get. And normally, what's done is that people fit two exponentials to it and call it a day. And, and that's fine, but I wanted to do a little bit better. So I asked, this is one of these COVID projects. So I asked my student to integrate uh, a semiconductor physics simulation package and wrap a, a MATLAB script around it. Use this generation diffusion drift recombination solver as the kernel, and then write a routine to do global chi-squared minimization. So that was kind of fun. So now we can take a bunch of TRPL data and refine a semiconductor physics model to it and actually get you know, key parameters out. So that's, that's satisfying to me. Um, if you don't know what that is, then you know, it's fine. You can skip it because it's satisfying to me. It doesn't have to be satisfying to everybody. But these are the kind of results that we're getting now. So for instance, um, on a 327 crystal, we can scan temperature dependence 
and measure the lifetime and do this global fitting where we hold reasonable things constant and let other reasonable things float. We can measure the fluence dependence of the, of the decay curves and fit this all within the context of the semiconductor physics model. And this is kind of the, the top line number here. For instance, at 200 Kelvin, um, we're getting, you know, excited state diffusion lengths on the order of 20 microns. So that's really good. It's really exciting for us because it means that we should push to try to make devices out of these materials. Um, this is a temperature dependence of the Shockley Reed Hall recombination uh, inverse rate and stuff. So this is really exciting for us and, and uh, it means that we should continue pushing. And we can put these on these plots. So here, uh, you know, we haven't made solar cells out of these materials yet. So the y axis here is, is not existing for our, our materials yet, that's solar cell efficiency. But now we have data along the x-axis, and we can see that these carcogenite perovskites, in terms of lifetime, are comparing with the best, best SIGs and halide perovskite materials. And further, if we use the commonly used solar cell figure of merit, which is um, a dimensionless quantity that compares diffusion length with absorption length, right? So you want to absorb strongly and get the carriers out. Um, so uh, if you, you know, work out the dimensional analysis, you, you come up with something like this which is an absorption length and a diffusion length, and you use that as a figure of merit, you know, that collapses a lot of um, high quality PV publications onto one, you know, I won't call it a curve, but, you know, one trend. And there also are calcogenite perovskites, you know, are really exciting. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're up here with, well, on the low end with CZTS and on the high end here with gallium arsenide. Uh, so, so this says go, this says, you know, you should make some devices. And this is very preliminary results on our thin film. So, you know, I'm gonna show you a lot of work on thin films in, in the next 20, 20 minutes, but, you know, we do similar measurements on our thin films and uh, we get also very encouraging results. Okay, so they might be good semiconductors. What about, what about um, mobility, charge, trans, charge transfer, uh, char, charge <laughs> mobility? So here, I'm gonna show you kind of a really fancy way of measuring mobility, because we were trying to do a bunch of different things at once. We were doing IR reflectivity at 10 microns. So at 10 microns, you, you, you can be in the long wavelength limit and you can do things like measure um, low, low frequency transport. And so we did that and we measured the anisotropy in this 327 crystal. So there's a lot of fancy stuff going on here that I could come back to if you're curious. But again, the top line number is that we're again, through a complementary technique, a different technique uh, from, from what I showed you before, measuring very large mobilities and very large diffusion lengths um, for excited state transport in these semiconductors. So that's exciting for us. Um, all right, so, so again, preliminary, this, this is, you know, near, near you know, hopefully published soon measurements on single crystals. Here's preliminary data on thin films. Again, suggestive of very, fast charge transport. And, and these numbers, you know, 100 mobilities greater than 100 are, you know, among perovskite structured materials, I think it's only the stannics that compare. Um, and that's all current research. Um, so I'm excited about that. Okay. So those are some properties, right? So now for those of you who do work on semiconductors, I hope you're kind of excited by, by that. So now I wanna show you a, a little bit more on fundamentals again, which is about solid state chemistry. Um, okay. So the third story is about solid state chemistry. Now here's an interesting observation. Um, okay, this, this could be my freshman solid state chemistry class at some level. Bonding determines electronic structure, which determines semiconducting properties and performance, right? That's like a truism. All right, here's where it gets interesting. If you look at the Rubis and Popper series of the sulfides, what we actually see is that as you confine charge carriers in individual layers. These are sometimes called 2D perovskites. The band gap shrinks. Go from here to here to here. And this is contrary to everyone's experience with oxides and halides. And oxides and halides here are showing STO and, and, and uh, uh, a MAPI blend. Uh, the intuition and the, and the data show that as you confine carriers, the band gap increases. And it's thought to be a quantum confinement effect. But we see the opposite in, in calcogenite perovskites. And if you go and you look at the crystal structure, the actual answer is staring you in the face. So 
This is an illustration of the bond angles in this perovskite and this rubus and popper structure. What I want you to see is that the tilt system straightens up. So the bond angles actually go closer to 180 degrees when you move from the 113 to the 327. The key thing here is that, you know, these aren't really ionic crystals. These are ionic crystal structures, right? They're octahedrally coordinated. There are rock salt-like characteristics here, but they're really covalent crystals. And because of that, the directional bonding is terribly important, right? This is like late transition metal complex oxides. The directional bonding is really important for understanding the low temperature, the, the low energy physics. And so when you straighten out the bond angles going from 113 to 327, you simply get more dispersion and the band gap shrinks. Um, so we decided to do some experiments to look at this in more detail. So what we did was a lot of X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Um, so here, for example, I'm showing you the sulfur K edge absorption for the 113 and the 327. We're gonna be focusing on, on that, that sometimes called the pre-edge, sometimes called the white line, basically the first bump in the spectrum at the sulfur K edge. And this illustration shows you why it's so interesting to me. If you have an ionic species, purely ionic, like a textbook ionic species, the sulfur 3p manifold is full. So you can't excite an electron from the core to that state because the states are full. However, if you hybridize, then you open up some ligand hole character on the sulfur 3p manifold. And now you have some states that are empty. And therefore you can have a core level transition to, to those states. And so the, the, the spectral weight here tends to scale with covalency. The more covalent a compound is, the more spectral weight you observe it. And um, that's not an original idea. This is used you know, uh, for decades to, to measure you know, different sulfide compounds. Um, you won't find any longer papers than earth scientists studies of sulfides by, by Zanes. They're like enormous papers. So there's a lot we, we're learning here from other fields. And so that, that sort of experimental and, and sort of freshman chemistry level understanding we can go farther. We're using a lot of DFT, VASP, and FDM and ES calculations to model this. And, and you know what that the theory can do for you is it can you can calculate Zane spectra and you can decompose by orbital, or you can decompose by site, or you can decompose by band. And when you can do that, you really can look in detail at what you know orbital sites and bands are responsible there. And that's very satisfying to me. Um, so what did we find? So here's an example. This is now we're using polarized x-rays, which you get for free from the synchrotron. And we're using single crystals, those little guys. And we're varying this polarization angle in between the, the x-rays, the electric field, and the, um, the basal plane of these layered crystal structures. And you know, when we have the, the, the corner sharing perovskite, there's almost no angular dependence, which is what you would expect, because it's like pseudo-cubic. It's not cubic, but it's, it's close to cubic. However, when you have the layered structure, you have a big dependence on, of, on the angle, which is, again, it's a layered crystal. That's what you would expect. And so we can query that. And so this is what we do. We look at, at, at that varying low angle shoulder of the spectrum. And then we go to theory and we do basically correlation. And we look to see what does theory do that, that looks like this. And we can identify which particular sulfur sites are responsible for which particular features in the spectrum through that angular dependence. So that's kind of new. I mean, I think it's new. It, it's really, we're, we're really pulling on this thread, right? It, maybe we're going a little too far, but we're having a lot of fun comparing what theory can, can, can model and, and what our experiments can measure in terms of trying to really illustrate the, the solid state chemistry there that's responsible for the band edge. So, so, so when we do that, um, you know, what we identify is that and again, this doesn't necessarily have to be intuitive. It's just what we find. The sulfur bilayer sites, that is the sulfurs in between, if you think of the Brutus and Popper as a sandwich, this is the meat and the sandwich. It's the, it's the central layer of sulfur items. There are pi star bonds or overlap. Technically, pi star are not bonds, they're antibonds. They're pi star antibonds that are responsible for that lowest energy feature in the zanes. Those pi star antibonds are also responsible for the lowest energy conduction band structure. And, and they're also responsible for, for that steep dispersion that you get in plane. So, you know, what we see here is if you look at these electron density maps here, looking from the top down here, looking from the side, 
you know, you can almost see the electron waves propagating freely in the layers. And it's kind of funny how these pi, these pi star bonds here between the sulfur p orbitals and these zirconium g orbitals. Um, you know, you can kind of imagine the electrons flowing through the crystal. Now, now I'm, you know, this is where the, the data ends and my imagination begins. But, you know, I'm trying to explain, you know, what right do these crystals have having such high charge transfer mobility? And I think this strong degree of covalent overlap is, is the reason why. So um, that's, that's the end of the solid state chemistry lecture for today. So, so now I want to end. The last, the last bit I want to tell you about is, is um, I'm going a little fast, it seems is probably the longest, and this is about making materials. Um, so a brief history of calcogenite perovskite synthesis. Uh, these materials have been made since the 1950s. There, you know, it seems like every 20 or 30 years or so, there is a solid state chemistry publication. If you combine these elements in an ampule, evacuate it and, and heat it to between 800 and 1,100 degrees C for on the order of a couple of days and cool down, uh, you know, you'll get these phases. So they're thermodynamically stable and such. So, you know, you have these, these powders and, and then you have, um, uh, you have them existing in the crystallographic uh, um, databases. So, you know, their crystal structures are not. But it wasn't until about 10 years ago that anyone started to think about these as, as semiconductors. You know, not just, not just minerals, but, but, you know, what are the semiconducting properties here? And so you get a wave of, of, you know, revisiting these powder synthesis with a focus on semiconductivity and band gap. Um, so what comes next is my, you know, friend and collaborator, Jay Ravichandran developed a single crystal growth, which was essential for a lot of the measurements that I, that I presented in the last 20 minutes. But of course, thin films have to come next, right? If you're gonna make devices. And so the first wave of thin films really occurred, uh, appeared about a year, year and a couple months ago. And there's a couple of groups around the world that are doing this now by sulfurization of oxide films. So oxide films are put down by chemical baths, chemical solution deposition or PLD or sputtering, I believe in some cases, and then sulfurized in a, in a tube print. And uh, my, my lab does a lot of sulfurization experiments, not with these materials. So, you know, that's something else to talk about, but Long story short, for this material system, it doesn't produce good materials. So you get these polycrystalline thin films, lots of random grain boundaries. You know, the phase is unclear um, and it requires very high temperatures to sulfurize. Sulfur is a real bear. And so, you know, when you sulfurize a film at like a thousand degrees or even 1200 degrees, you get a lot of coarsening. You know, it's not a recipe for, for really good, you know, device fabrication. Right, so our approach was that we were gonna to try to basically do an end run around all of this by going straight to MBE because I admired a lot of the history of oxide MBE and I said, okay, let's do this for glycogenides. So we have this heavily customized uh, system with the fusion cells and an E-beam, um, which, you know, effective but problematic. Basically, I hate its guts, but I can't live without it. That's the E-beam. Uh, we may have gas injectors for H2S and H2SE. We have plasma sources now, although those weren't used for this work, but we now have them and we're playing with them and read an RGA. So, um, you know, why gas source MBE? Why do that? My motivation is that it allows you control over sulfur and selenium alloys. So you can make one and you can start alloying another a lot easier than, than developing a new solid source. It's also a lot easier on vacuum systems. Sulfur and selenium are really bad. Sulfur in particular is really bad for vacuum systems. There's a reason a lot of people don't like to do sulfides in vacuum systems. Um, so we decided we would try to figure that out. And just as important, it's proven for 262. So you will find a lot of work from the late 80s on gas source 26 epi, a lot of it from Japan, some from MIT and, uh, and, and Naval Research Lab. And all of this work stopped when GAN, you know, when the Japanese group figured out um, P-type GAN. So it's like, it was all for solid state lighting. And as soon as GAN took off, this work stopped. And so you know, I kind of had to reinvent a lot of the, the, the source stuff. And I tried contacting some of these old fellows in Japan and it, it wasn't going to lead anywhere. So I kind of had to reinvent stuff. So we, you know, we have compressed liquefied 100% hydrogen sulfide and 100% hydrogen selenide. We have point of use purification. That turns out to be really important 
So if anyone's thinking about getting into this, please contact me and I'll send you more information on this than you ever, than, than well, I'll send you a lot of information that actually you, you, I think you will need, not more information than you ever need to know. And then, you know, we do other things like, this is a view in the chamber. These are um, proximity gas injectors. So these carry the, the gas up and you can see these little, these little pinholes. And so it's like a little garden hose of death, right? It's a little soaker hose of death. So these are the proximity gas injectors, one each for hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen selenide. So we can really increase the activity of these um, gases without having to increase the chamber pressure necessarily. Um, okay, so we're gonna do epitaxial growth, which means substrate selection is really important. So this is a number line here. And, and what I've shown down here is a lot of complex oxides, which many of you are familiar with perhaps. And these are, for example, available as um, commercial substrates. And up here are calcogenite and perovskites. And so you see there's a, there's a big problem here because there's a big lattice mismatch. So, you know, we hypothesize that, that we'll be able to get this sort of 45 degree rotated epi, a root, root two to the rescue, right? Sort of grow along the hypotenuse. Um, and so and I take the green lines and I just multiply by root two, I, I get the light blue lines. And so, you know, that suggests some, some uh, substrates that we can use. And so for this particular work, we're looking at, at barium zirconium sulfide on lanthanum aluminate. So still a pretty significant lattice constant mismatch, but that's what, that's what we're doing. Okay, so the long story short is that it works. So we get smooth and epitaxial calcogenite frostite thin films. And the first real surprise to us is that they were not strained to the LAO interface. This is read data. Um, it, they're brightly colored, mirror smooth, brightly colored even at 20 nanometers thick. So they have very strong optical interactions. And we have almost no evidence of atomic segregation or diffusion at the interface. So we have these atomically sharp oxide perovskite to sulfide perovskite interfaces. We do have the formation of, of self-limited native oxide at the, at the top surface, which you know I, I could tell you more about, but that's not the point of today's talk. Um, so the XRD and the STEM illustrates that there are these two really peculiar growth modes. Um, the first, and this was such a surprise, is that the pseudocubic edge of the sulfide perovskite grows aligned with the pseudocubic edge of the oxide perovskite, despite the 30% lattice constant mismatch. And the film grows beautifully. It grows relaxed, strain-free. And what we have discovered, and we have more data that I'm not going to show today, is that there is a self-assembled buffer layer, which has the characteristics of a van der Waals gap, which forms on the oxide in that hydrogen sulfide rich condition of the chamber that fully relaxes the strain. And, and this we definitely did not expect. Now, when we can find step edges in the substrate, then we do see this strained root two epi where you have the BZS growing on the hypotenuse of the LAO. And that material is much less beautiful because this, you know, if you remember, there's still a pretty significant lattice constant mismatch there between LAO and, and BZS. And so we get this you know, much less beautiful material and that happens at, at step edges. And we can, we can control the extent of this beautiful self-assembled, self-buffered epi and this direct bonded strained epi. We can control that with substrate selection and with H2S gas flow. So we're sort of studying that interface conservation. Um, in a little more detail here, you know, this, this first mode what we call M1, this dominant mode, we have the self-assembled buffer layer, which just forms. It's, it's just kind of amazing that it just forms. And so we get this pseudocube on pseudocube alignment here, here showing from the side view, BZS on LEO, here showing from the top view, BZS on LEO, with the LEO rhombohedral and the BZS uh, orthorhombic cells illustrated. And then when we have direct epi, it's particularly nucleating at step edges, we have this other growth mode, which is strained and less beautiful and um, right. Okay, so this level of detail, you know, I could come back to it. You know, it's in, the, it's in our paper. So if you want to dive into that. Um, I also want to pause and recognize Jay Ravachandran, who I mentioned before. He's my collaborator and friend at USC. He made the single crystals. We did a lot of these studies together. While he was developing, while I was developing MBE, he was developing PLD and we help each other a lot out here. And so, 
right around the same time, he published um, a similar growth on SLAO uh, by PLD. And they, they see some similar things that we see. They see some different things. PLD and MB obviously are complementary to each other. So they're having fun here in this space. All right. So we can do more. Uh, these grow non epitaxially We don't need an epitaxial substrate. So this is an example of a growth on sapphire with no lattice match to speak of. And when we grow on sapphire, we get these non epitaxial polycrystalline, very textured thin films. So they're still dense. They're still atomically smooth. They're still very beautiful looking. But the STEM, or uh, inter integrated differential phase contrast, uh, TEM, shows you uh, that you basically have texture growth. So that's kind of interesting. Um, say, but wait, there's more. You know, so because we have these gas sources, we can then immediately go and look at alloys. Um, so, uh, for instance, the, the barium zirconium selenide is theoretically predicted to not form in the perovskite. It's predicted to form in this needle-like phase with this structure type. Um, so I'll show you the surprise there. But first of all, we have, for example, when we when we take the calcogenide, the sulfide perovskite, and we alloy in selenium, this is a 40% selenium alloy, um, we get the perovskite structure with a reduced band gap. And I'm not showing you the, the, spe the, uh, the spectra here. It's enough just to use your eyeballs, right? You can see that, that this is a reduced band gap. So we're going to do spectrophotometry just by eye. So we get that perovskite structure. Um, we can do more. We, we can go to roots of popper material. So, so this actually is, is now um, two on four phase with 40% selenium. This is actually a heterostructure. It's a sulfide, sulfide selenium alloy heterostructure, three period heterostructure. And again, your eye tells you that the band gap is being reduced. So we can reduce the band gap by selenium alloying and or by, by layering in those roots of popper structures. And you know, having MBE means you know we have basically a lot of knobs we can tune to get to get the phase that we like. Now here's um, so that's that's very satisfying for us, although it's perhaps not unexpected from what we know about the system. Here's the first really big surprise: when we grow barium zirconium selenide, um, it grows in a hexagonal phase, which is not predicted to be stable by DFD. But even more surprising, it grows with a larger band gap. And we've confirmed this is bearing zirconium selenide. Theory predicts this band gap to be in the, the, the mid IR, like 0.1 and 0.2 EV. And theory has been a good guide for band gap so far. But on this one, it seems to totally fall flat because you know we've grown these several times now and you know it's green. <laughs> so it's got a higher band gap. It's somewhere in the twos. And we have some data on that. But anyway, so, so that's the first really big surprise that we get this hexagonal phase with an increased band gap. So, um, you know, this work is ongoing. Okay, so, so what can I say here about, about my plot? I can say that, you know, we can make that epitaxially. That's the barium zirconium sulfide. We can now alloy and tune the band gap. These pictures here are evidence of that. But that, that pure selenide is right now a mystery to us. I don't know what's going on. So, so we need to figure that out. Right. Okay, one more, one more technical point. And this really is for those folks who care about such things. Um, the conditions that are successful for making these calcogenide perovskites are unsuccessful to make zirconium disulfide and zirconium diselenide. So when we grow with just zirconium metal on a, on a suitable substrate like sapphire, um, we don't get zirconium four plus. We don't get zirconium disulfide and zirconium diselenide. We get these mixed valence phases. Um, which, which are in the phase diagram. They're, they're very little study, but you know, they're there. And so we can, we can use, you know, we can, um, we can do phase ID with, that, with, that, with diffraction. And, and um, you know, they're, they're very conductive. And so what's going on here, you know, there's a topic in nitride literature called inductive oxidation, which I don't claim to understand fully. But the idea is that you know, sometimes if you have a hard to oxidize element, um, uh, adding a more electropositive element can somehow help with the oxidation. And I, I don't, again, I don't understand that. <laughs> I'm just repeating what's in the literature. So we have a hard to oxidize zirconium and we add more electropositive barium and somehow the zirconium oxidizes. 
to four plus. Now, I think it's simply the thermodynamics that these calcogenic peroxides are very stable, and so they form, and there's less driving force to form zirconium sulfide and zirconium selenide. But you know, we're sort of studying this. So if you're interested in such things, you know, please put in chat at some point. Okay. So this is the picture I want to leave you with. Um, you know, I wouldn't have any of this if it weren't for my uh, collaborator, Jim LeBeau here, who is a STEM wizard. So you could definitely acknowledge Jim LeBeau and his group. And okay, so now acknowledge my group. So this is us uh, in the fall, I think. We hiked up to the top of a local ski mountain. Ida and Kevin are the postdoc and student who are responsible for, for this work. Um, and uh, then I realized I was presenting to the folks in Alabama. So I thought I would show you what snow looks like. This is actually a, a week ago or two weeks ago. Uh, we went skiing in New Hampshire. And so we went through a ski mountain, but actually now with snow. So that was fun. And um, also Sung Soon had just defended her thesis like days or a week before. So we got to celebrate her. And, um, and just, you know, so I told you about caltogenic, complex caltogenic semiconductors. Uh, this is one of three themes in my group. We do this, we do a lot of layered materials for photonics, for integrated photonics. And then I do a lot of work on, on point defect physics of photoconductors and some weird kind of implications of that. So these are all things I like to think about. Um, so if you do too, you know, we can, we can chat. And uh, I would like to acknowledge um, funding and, and, and folks who did the work. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Um, questions, and there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, how do you avoid the toxicity of hydrogen sulfide gas? <laughs> um, we don't, I mean, it, you can't really avoid it in the sense that it's there. Um, I, how do we avoid, how do we work with it? I mean- I uh, guess, yeah, how do we um, work with so it? So one way that, that so I'm that 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 in, in the following way, um, that when, when I started and I said I wanted to do this stuff with these gases, it just so happened that we had a professor who was um, ramping down his research program, who had a lab who for, for decades had worked with silane and germane and phosphine. And so we had the, the, um, the gas sensing equipment in place. And so um, the gas sensors that are used in, in fabs um, and elsewhere, they, they don't discriminate between different hydrides. They're just different sensitivity levels. But it's the same equipment. So it, the, the silane and, and so forth equipment could be repurposed for H2S and H2SE. Um, so we, you know, we operate safely. I know what those gases smell like. I know that my sensitivity yeah. level <laughs> is below one ppb. So you know, I know what hydrogen selenide smells like. I think that puts me in a, in a small club of people worldwide. Um, and uh, and other than that, you know, we we don't have we don't have a big scrubber. It, it's if you saw our setup, you'd say. Really, like that's it. You know, one of the benefits is that because it's MBE, we, we don't use more than like two skim. And so it was determined that, you know, the two skim running through the pumps and then going up the stack, because that a particular exhaust manifold gets 400 CFM, it, it gets diluted well below the, the, the level. So we can just stand it right up the stack. Um, I have all sorts of stories about that. I mean, as you can imagine. Um, but, uh, and then so so in terms of safety, you know, uh, it's it's fine. We we manage uh, just fine uh, with a very large safety margin. In terms of maintaining equipment, I think that's more of a challenge that I've I've solved a lot of problems there. Um, maintaining a vacuum chamber with S and SC kicking around uh, yeah. is just sort of an interesting uh, adventure. So lots of stories there. But you know, we've this chamber's been running for years, and and I know I know what components work, and I know some that don't. And I'm very, very happy to share that knowledge with anybody who's interested. Well, sounds like an adventure indeed. Another question, how do the PLD grown films compare with the MBE grown films? So the crystallinity is, is inferior. Um, mm -hmm. we, we haven't done transport measurements on the PLD grown film, so I can't, I can't speak to that. We also know that they have more of a challenge sulfurizing. So I suspect, although this is just speculation that in addition to having the crystallinity you can measure by TEM and X30, it's just clear, right? You can see that the MB films are, are of a higher crystal quality. And that's expected based on what we know about these methods. Um, in terms of electronic properties, I predict that the PLD films probably suffer from a very large sulfur vacancy concentration, uh, knowing the conditions that they operate in. And that likely impacts 
transport properties in ways that we don't yet know. Um, those studies are ongoing and we work collaboratively on all this stuff. So this isn't like, oh, mine are better, is it works? It's just very different, right? These are two methods, each with their own uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, one big strength of the PLD is that it has tends to have higher uptime and they can grow faster. So they, they we have we struggle to grow like several hundred nanometers. In fact, we've never grown several hundred nanometers. I think 200 nanometers is the longest that we've ever attempted to grow. And um, and uh, there's lots of reasons for that. And you know, they're not insurmountable, but that's kind of where we are today. And the PLD, they can routinely grow uh, you know, 200 nanometers. So I think that's that's a big difference. Um, Okay. But in terms of in terms of the ep the epitaxial relationship with the substrate and the the formation of a, of a self passivating native oxide, those are both very similar between the two methods. So it's kind of an interesting observation. All right. There are more questions. Um, he would try to fabricate solar cell with this material. Okay, Mohammed, which material did you mean specifically? Because Raphael spoke about a few materials. Um, well, I can, I can, mm -hmm. I can tackle both of those. I mean, so we're we're working on it. That's the next the next frontier. Mm -hmm. um, I, okay. And how? Another question: How do the activation energies from transport compare to optical measurements? Well, we don't have any activation energies for transport. I assume you mean caricon, like um, donor or acceptor activation energies. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't uh, we don't have those yet we have uh only just just getting into gear to do sort of traditional um temperature independent hall or van der we don't have the data yet so okay uh, yeah. well, uh, i will say the, the materials are mm -hmm. um they're very very low carry concentration as made um something like 10 to the 13 10 to the 14 which is kind of surprising and they have very strong photoconductivity. So if we just put leads on and then use your cell phone camera, you see the response jump. So it kind of behaves like a lot like a, it behaves a lot like like Mappy and Fappy in that way, the halide perovskites. Um, so if I had to guess, if we tried to do hull, if we tried to do temperature dependent hull in the dark, we might have a hard time figuring out what's going on. And in the light, of course, you're measuring something different. So it might not be that easy. It might not be that straightforward, but I'm just speculating. We don't have the data yet. All right, other questions? You can also turn on your camera and speak up. Uh, sorry, my webcam is not connected right now. I, I would like to ask one question to Professor. Um, first, it was a very nice talk. I just enjoyed it listening. It's a very, indeed, a nice work. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, if we grow these films, these uh, silicogenite films, in a different orientation with the substrate. So do we have the any changes on the electronic properties or optical properties? Uh, like I don't one know. One or one zero zero orientation? So, so I don't know, um, because we, we've only grown on, on LA on S. So we've grown on Sapphire, we've grown on, and we haven't studied those films a lot. We've grown on LAO and SLAO. Mm -hmm. uh, and they pretty much look the same. In fact, actually, when you go on SLAO, the S disappears. In, during in the chamber, so it's almost like growing an LAO. So we have no difference there. Um, I don't know if I have this data. So, so our measurements on the single crystals, we have done a lot of sectioning of the one one three and the three two seven, and produced crystals with faces, including you know the, with the basal plane in in plane or out of plane. If you you know, okay, you can imagine, right? So we we've been able to study an, uh, the, the anisotropy of properties. Of single mm -hmm. crystals, and so I'm just showing you some representative images here. Um, we've done the infrared reflectivity measurements uh, as a function of, of angle here, and we get about a factor of ten difference in mobility. Of course, it's higher in plane than out of plane. I, I think I have that data. So actually, that data is hiding right here. I didn't. I didn't really emphasize it. But that's 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 what that is. Um, so that's kind of it's it's the trend you would expect. You know, we can now put numbers on it. Um, mm -hmm. We have polarization-dependent Raman spectroscopy, which is just a fun bunch of data I didn't show. We have polarization-dependent. Um, uh, that, that that might be it actually. Uh, oh yeah, we have the dielectric responsive low frequency, but that I, 
uh, as you might expect, doesn't have a huge dependence. Um, so, right. So in terms of thin films with different with different substrate orientations and so forth, we're, we're really not there yet. Yeah, I mean, hopefully right. someday watch this space. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Sue Gupta from M Metallurgical Engineering. That was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And um, I just wanted to ask you if your time resolved photoluminescence uh, measurements were done in your facility, in your lab? No. It, I, so, no. The answer is no. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I had it. I, said, I, I, I beg, borrow, and steal time on other instruments. It's, it's like a whole host of different ones. But actually, I will. So, two things. First of all, um, if, I, if the AFOSR program manager I spoke to two days ago was on the phone, like, or is, is that his call? <laughs> Listen up. So, you know, I'm trying to get my money to get this such a tool. But more seriously, uh, the data which you saw was almost all measured at Argonne National Lab at the Center for Nan Nanoscale Materials through a user agreement. So, uh, and Ben Durrell, Dr. Durrell is, is a scientist there. So actually, we just, it was mail-in. That started during COVID. But I think even not during COVID, it could be mail-in. And so um, it's, of course, much more slow than doing it in your own lab. Um, but uh, I find through that user agreement that he has more invested than when I go and sort of squat in other group labs around campus, you know, where the setup is different every day or, you know, you're sort of relying on the generosity of not strangers, but, you know, other graduate students in their own projects. So um, I can recommend that, that method to get such data. And I could, you know, add, email me later if you want, you know. I will. Either, Thank you. Know. you. Mm -hmm. Right. Other questions? If not, let's thank Dr. Haramir again. Thank you. It was a lot of fun.